I know. I know. I, can you imagine? The first time I saw him from behind, I was like, yeah. and then I didn't realize it was him. I was like, oh, it's oh, a no. it must be a bald woman. <laughs> Okay. We'll call the meeting to order. Nikki, please note the roll. Just to let everybody know, we did update the agenda and include a third uh, closed session for tonight. Is there any public comments? Any emails that you no. guys received? Nope. nope. Next on the agenda is going to be the minutes of the regular meeting of the Board of Directors held on May 3rd of 2023. <clears throat> the regular meeting of the Michigan South Central Power Agency Board of Commissioners held on April 6th of 2023. Also, the departmental reports for the Board of Public Utilities operation reports and financial statements for April of 23. Also, the bills and accounts for period ending May 31st of 23. The power supply cost projections, the MERS defined benefit uh, pension plan statement for the quarter ending March 31st of 2023. Is there anything we need to discuss? Any questions? Seeing none, we need a motion. Motion to approve the minutes. Support. You got a motion to support. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Motion passes. Next on the agenda is the introduction of the interns. I think it's Andrew and Abby that's going to be presenting them. Okay, no. <laughs> Andrew? Andrew? Is your name Andrew? <laughs> you weren't expected it or what? I thought maybe we'd break it up a little bit, but uh, thank you, President Stevens. Yep. And, uh, good evening, members of the board. Uh, it has been since 2019, since the engineering department last had interns. Uh, if you recall, I also started my journey at Coldwater as an intern, so very happy to continue this program and uh, look for the next generation of engineers to uh, join the industry. So with that, I'd like to bring up uh, Brayton Franklin as well as uh, Frank Monig, our engineering and GIS interns, to uh, do a brief introduction of themselves. Gentlemen. Well, for starters, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Brayton Franklin. I'm a computer engineer at Trine. I'll be a senior coming up, and I'm also a member of Phi Kappa Theta fraternity. Um, we're looking forward to working with you guys. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, I am Frank Monig. I am going in my junior year at Trine University, electrical engineering major. Excited to be here and great opportunity to learn. Thank you. Next on the agenda. Oh, it, we got one more. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you got one too. I didn't really no, have two. Fine. I would actually like to introduce you to Audrey Steele, who's our first summer marketing assistant and intern. So, Audrey, if you want to come up here and give a brief introduction. Hi, everybody. My name is Audrey. I'm uh, going to be a sophomore at Grand Valley State University, um, majoring in advertising and public relations with a minor in marketing. and. Lived through my whole life, so it's fun getting involved and giving back. And yeah, I'm excited to see what happens the rest of the summer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next on agenda is Brian Torres Alcantar, uh, the OJT experience presentation. Uh, evening, board members. Uh, yeah, so my name is Brian Torres Alcantar. I just recently graduated from here from Coldwater High School this past Sunday, and this is just a presentation about my experience here over the past year. All right, so like I said, I'm from Coldwater High School, just graduated, and I was the, uh, two for two years, I was the Branch Area Career Center's Business Professionals of America chapter president, as well as the Business Professionals of America parliamentarian on the state level. Uh, I'm in both the symphonic band and the Coldwater High School marching band. I play the trombone, and I just want to say that I, I absolutely loved the opportunity that was given to me uh, this past year to work, work alongside CUPU. And so kind of some of the basics and fundamentals is that they tested like my skills and what I learned uh, two years ago at the Career Center, and it helped me kind of decide what, what needs to go first, what needs to 
get finished first. And then from there also helped me focus on working under pressure to try to get some, try to get uh, like task A, B, or C done within a certain time frame. Um, and especially my customer service skills uh, before this past year, I wasn't, I wasn't 100% very social, but I feel that throughout this year, that's definitely increased and I'm more social and I ask more questions when it comes to, to improving my troubleshooting technique, trying to get more information on the problem at hand. And I'm more willing to ask for help um, with my teammates, such as Scott, Sheila, and Pat. Um, and some of these projects that were given to me over the year uh, helped me prepare to what to expect in the workforce now that uh, I'll be going, now that I'll be leaving the high school and starting to work in the workforce and essentially allowed me to take the wheel and kind of have my own spin on things. But it did mean that I had to navigate a lot of different obstacles. Um, one of these projects I done, did was the Windows feature updates, making sure that we keep all our computers up to date and they're running the latest patches um, and security details. And it, I had to navigate a lot of different issues that were in the case system that it was something weird in within that software that that wasn't really allowing updates to go through. After talking with a case, I we ended up we en did end up figuring it out and getting the window feature updates to to over 95% of the computers here. But some of them were kind of problematic to update due to some storage issues. There's just some computers and users have so many dot sorry, have so much data and files on it that it just makes it difficult to run that update. And then updating and removing Bluebeam. This one was a significantly bigger issue. So for some context, Bluebeam software is the software that we use for our PDF viewers. Um, and we got it, I believe, around three years ago. And you know, over those three years, they've passed newer versions of, of the software. And we've been trying to work towards getting all these com all our computers in our system to have that newest up newest version of Bluebeam. And we, I, had, I had to sit down with Josh and go through our system policies to make sure that, that I could run scripts uh, and some context there. So just some scripts are just a series of commands that are pushed through on the computers. Um, and I also had to meet with, <clears throat> with, Quest, with Quest themselves, the owners of our case system, to also resolve some issues in the system. And lastly, uh, the console chamber uh, camera system. Throughout this past year, I've been running the cameras and microphone microphone system for these meetings, um, and making sure that they're running smoothly. They they get transmitted on YouTube clearly. And there was some um, you know some slight microphone issues. I don't remember if you guys were uh, remember about I think a month ago there was a high pitched squealing with these microphones that would occur every once in a while, and we ended up having to talk with Smart Homes, our AV um, helpers to get that figured out and it's fixed now. So no high pitch squealing. And so overall, I just, I, th I feel I just become more involved in everything that I've been doing here at CPU. And I've, I've, I really like to think that I've experienced some growth in troubleshooting, my confidence, my work ethic and my experience. And really working here with CPU increased my confidence in my decision and career choice into going to Western Michigan University uh, to study uh, cybersecurity. And I feel it just opened up a lot of new and exciting opportunities. And I want to thank those who those people who have invested in me, such as Patrick Poole, Sheila Puffenberger, Scott Mischke, Josh Smith, and Craig, Craig Figaro. And I want to thank you guys, all of you guys, for your time here. Thank you. Well, thanks for all your hard work. We appreciate what you've done for us. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the uh, budgets. Hello, good evening. Good evening. All right. So in your packets, you will have um, the capital plans and the fiscal year 24 budgets for each of the four funds. I know we have a long agenda tonight, so I'll try to make this brief and we'll just talk about a few components of each fund. And we'll start out with the electric fund. Um, as I think you guys know, we're still working with utility financial solutions on our current cost of service <laughs> study. And uh, so we budgeted a 2% rate increase. We just built that into the budget as a placeholder um, until we get those final um, 
rate adjustments that they might recommend. And we'll bring those to you when we have them. Um, total operating revenue, we are projecting around 51 and a half million. Um, we just base that on our customers' current usage. We're not expecting any large increases or decreases that we're aware of. Um, one new item that you will see on the budget is the fiber access fee revenue. That's the fee that the telecom fund is going to be paying the electric fund for use of the fiber assets that the electric fund paid for. Um, power supply adjustment is forecasted to be a bit higher this year. AMP has projected that our um, cost per kilowatt hour will be a touch higher than last year. Um, moving on to expenses. Um, as I said, the cost per kilowatt hour is supposed to be a bit higher, so we will um, be estimating just over eight cents per kilowatt hour. And the total cost of um, to purchase the power this year is 38 million that we'll be expecting from what we were given from AMP. So um, on wages and benefits, we're currently in negotiations with the unions right now. So for budget purposes, we have built in an average, just a 5% placeholder. Again, until those negotiations are final, this is not a final number. Um, it's final for the budget, but it won't be necessarily final spending. Um, defined benefit plan payments, we're gonna keep those the same as they were last year in fiscal year 23. Overall, it's a million dollars for all the BPU funds. About 50% of that is applicable to the electric fund. Um, our material costs, we're still um, seeing those as elevated in the distribution department, so you'll see a larger budget there for supplies. Uh, substation maintenance, we are going to have two of our substations that are due for maintenance this year at $75,000 a piece. Those were budgeted initially last year, and they, they are being pushed back to the fall of fiscal year 24. And the pilot payment that the electric fund pays to the city for fiscal year 24 is gonna be about 2.7 million. And that is based on the fiscal year 22 revenues. And then depreciation expense for the electric fund is budgeted at 2.2 million. Um, for the capital plan, Tom showed you guys these last month. The only change from last month to this month is that we had a truck that we could not get by the end of this fiscal year. So that's been pushed forward to 24. Uh, overall spending in this fund is about 2.4 million. Uh, moving on to the water fund. Um, utility financial solutions presented last month their cost of service studies for both water and wastewater. So our budget includes a 3.9% rate increase built in for the water department. Um, as far as usage goes, same as the electric department, this is just kind of based on current usage. We're not, we don't know of anything large increase or decrease that we need to account for. Um, overall revenue expected to be about 4 million this year. On the expense side, um, in you might notice a reduction in wages in the treatment department and an increase in the distribution department. Um, we have several employees that split their time between both of these departments and we align the budget to be closer with what they're actually working. So no change to the bottom line, but you might notice the difference there. Um, in the distribution department, we are continuing with our lead service replacement. We've, we've also budgeted an additional 30,000 to replace the galvanized services that were previously hooked to lead. Um, and as with the electric fund, no change to the DB payment for fiscal year 23. So that will stay the same at 230,000. And depreciation expenses budgeted at 890000 for fiscal year 24. Um, no changes since the last meeting to our capital plan. So we're just expecting to spend about 950000 here. Um, for the wastewater fund, again, these the 2.9% rate increase was um, recommended and approved at the last meeting. So our budget has that built in. And overall revenue in this fund is expected to be about 5.9 million. Um, in the treatment department, we've seen a really large increase in our chemical costs. We're not using more chemicals, 
they're just costing us more. So we have increased the budget there um, from 82,000 last year to 200,000 for the upcoming year. Um, and we expect depreciation in this department to be a little over one and a half million and capital cost um, a little, just under 1.7 million for this fund. And again, no changes since the last document that you guys were given. Okay, save the smallest, but sometimes the hardest fund um, to budget for, for last telecom fund. Um, we are continuing to convert our cable modem um, internet users over to fiber. We're planning and hoping to convert 60 current customers per month and then um, acquire 10 <coughs> new customers as well. That's based on kind of what we're seeing and where our department heads think will be. Um, all, ever, all other revenue in this fund is just based on our current subscriber counts. Um, I think in the last meeting, Tom mentioned that our TV customers are kind of decreasing as we increase our fiber customers. So that you might see too, um, but that's kind of a pass through. So as you see the revenue decrease, you also see the expense decrease. So it kind of washes out in the end. Um, electric water and wastewater are all now on the new fiber system. So we did go through this year and address the way that those three funds were being billed by the telecom fund. So that has been um, adjusted to reflect the fiber charges and it's based on connection points that each fund has to the fiber system. So that's something you will see a little bit, a little higher income from those three funds going into the telecom fund. And then um, the telecom fund now has the added expense of $232,000 that they are paying to the electric fund for access to the fiber assets. Um, the internet department, we still have the three technicians that we had hired for the rollout of the fiber project. And so the, that's about 200,000 in wages and benefits that we're still including in there for this upcoming fiscal year. And depreciation expense for the year is about 300000 And we did budget just a $50,000 placeholder in capital costs for um, upgrading fiber, adding new fiber to new buildings and um, multi-dwelling units that might be in the works. I think that's everything I have. If there are no questions, We'll ask for your approval tonight, and then this will be forwarded on to City Council for adoption with the overall city budget on Monday. And I appreciate your time, and also would like to thank all the BPU staff that helped the Finance Department with all the budget process. So, any questions? One quick question. How many uh, sure. cable subscribers we, or uh, internet subscribers do we have right now? Ooh, Tom, did you... We, uh, we have not gotten our... Uh, on the fiber itself, there's about 1,100, I think, the last time I looked. Let's, let's yeah. See um, and we're let's around 500-ish. There's as of end of April. And we're still Total. pretty busy on installs? Yes. Yes, we're still doing two, three installs a day, uh, depending on the amount of work that it takes to do each of those, those areas. So, And that's something that's really hard for us to project, um, especially when it comes to budget time as far as how can we maintain what we're anticipating for new subscribers? Because um, I know I questioned Amanda last week about just to make sure that we can hold true to the 70 additional customers as we start switching them over. And that's one of the things that we're working with uh, Abby and her group as well too, is to come up with how are we going to promote the exit strategy from cable TV if that's the route that we're going to be able to just be a streaming service for our customers. And I, I do know, I believe I have a meeting at the end of the month that was just scheduled for the streaming lounge. So more to come on that to help those customers that don't understand how to actual stream from a, a, a um, internet signal. They're used to the cable box and my signal won't come through unless I see the channels change in my box, but it's gonna be different. So we're gonna be able to have some employees be able to walk people through that process and give them what the different choices are. Yep. And uh, to follow up on that, have we thought about partnering with the Grawl Center to help have some sort of courses there 
and streaming. We have we have talked about that. We've also talked about getting into some of the senior centers, some of the mm -hmm. um, other other areas. Get out into the public, so the public really understands what we're trying to do. And mm -hmm. um, you know, just this past weekend, I had a uh, conversation with a customer about what they're paying now for a cable service compared to what they'd be paying on a streaming service, even paying for that additional streaming service itself. And they were looking at anywhere from eighty to one hundred dollars a month savings just by getting an internet only and then paying for a streaming service as well. Right. Any additional questions for anybody? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So if we approve the budget, what it'd be is uh, to approve the CBPU 2023-2024 fiscal year utility operating budget and capital budgets as presented and forward to the city council for inclusion in the city budget. So what is the desire of the board? I'll make a motion to approve. Thank I'll you. Su I'll support. Got a motion to support. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Motion passes. Next on the agenda is a CBPU uh, value to the city. I'll turn this over to the utility director. Well, thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. So one of the things that, that we often look at is what is the true benefit of the utility to the citizens of Coldwater? Um, is it just based on reliability and community involvement or, or is it a combination of all that? So this little presentation will walk you through and, and show you what the true financial benefit is of having a publicly owned utility and publicly governed utility in your, in your backyard. So the first slide here gives a little bit of a background on the electric. Uh, we have three 138 kV transmission feeds coming in from ITC, four 13.8 kV distribution substations, one 8320 distribution substations, two 138 kV customer-owned substations themselves, 88 miles of underground lines, 216 miles of overhead, a 1.8 megawatt solar field, a peak load of about 105 megawatts, and at this time this was for FY22, a 42.9 million dollar budget and that's just on the electric side as well on the water side we've got 117 miles of water main produced roughly three million gallons per day uh, i recently talked to brian massey about that and we were pushing almost four million a day with everyone watering in their their dying lungs so thank you and and don't be surprised when your bill comes in uh three water towers 1100 lead services that we need to replace we're looking at replacing those in three years with a $3.8 million budget. Wastewater, 78 miles of gravity mains, 12 miles of pressurized mains. Uh, we process roughly 3.5 million gallons per day of uh, wastewater and about a $5.6 million budget for wastewater. Telecom, 132 miles of fiber optic cable, 537 cable customers, 800 inter internet customers, 1,100 fiber to the home customers, roughly a 2.5 million dollar budget so what does that all really mean if you want to look at it from the standpoint of we're roughly a 60 million dollar a year company that it resides in cold water what is the value that we provide for that some of it has to do with faster restoration outage times are reduced we have uh, employees that are local helps that go through uh, distribution to the city's general fund I know this is a big thing uh, Amanda mentioned about the pilot and what those budgeted numbers are uh, if we were in an investor-owned area around consumers, they will pay you a franchise fee, which will be severely less than what the pilot is to um, the city. Um, also, we help fund local um, activities and support throughout our service territory. We have very competitive rates, and we'll get into those specifics here shortly. Uh, local employees, our local employment, it helps keep the money local. Our employees live where they work. And we'll see that benefit as well. And of course, local control means local accountability to our boards. So I'm sure you guys get lots of calls from customers regarding uh, different items. And we really appreciate that, that and way to funnel it and filter it through for us. We appreciate that. So we'll start with restoration benefits. And these numbers are from 2022. So as you can see, our CBPU is in red. And, and we'll go through each of the numbers. So the SADI number basically says, Overall, if a customer has an outage, how long am I going to be out? So we're roughly 74 minutes. Uh, consumers, uh, based on their data, is 911 minutes. So there's a little bit of uh, discrepancy there. Safety, the safety number is the inter interruption frequency. 
So that basically says is how often can you expect to have an outage on our system? We're looking at maybe a little over half an outage per customer for the entire system. Some may experience more, some may experience none, but overall it's roughly a half outage. As you can see from consumer's data, uh, an average consumer's customer can expect to be out a little over one and a half times uh, per year. The KD number basically says is how quickly can we restore those outages when, they're, when they happen? Uh, we're about 118 minutes. Our consumer is 569 minutes. So what does that all mean? Basically it says that we do a better job keeping the reliability on for our customers. And of course, that little blackout that we had back in early 2000s, they came up with a formula to determine what an outage caused or what an outage was and how that related to a cost. So because we have much more reliable system than consumers, we're looking at a savings or a benefit to our customers and, and our commercial customers as well of $228,000. Well little over $228,000 is a benefit that we provide to those customers for having quicker outage restoration times and less outages. The big one is the pilot, the transfer to the general fund. Uh, we're required by charter to distribute 6.5% of gross revenue. So what does that equate to? Roughly $3.5 million in FY22. And if you want to look at it from a standpoint of what does that really mean, it means that our distribution to the city is roughly the amount of money that the city collects in taxes every year. So if we didn't have that distribution to the city, chances are the, either the city's budget would have to be severely uh, cut or taxes would have to be doubled. So community involvement benefit, when we look at it, how much sponsorships do we do? We do sponsorship for Rotary, Kiwanis, United Way, Child Advocacy Center, local screw groups, et cetera. There's, there's a plethora of things and there'll be more to come as we try to update this on a once a year basis. In addition to that, we've provided over 500 plus volunteer hours to local organizations. Uh, could be a city held event. It could be uh, an event at Rotary or event at United Way. There, there's a lot of different things. So we've provided over 500 hours in one year and that benefit comes out to be roughly $68,000. So we started looking at shared city services. So if the utility wasn't around and we had, and the city had to pay for an attorney, they'd have to pay full freight for the attorney. <coughs> right now, CBPU is, is, is taking on half of that percentage of that cost for an attorney. Same thing on the finance side, the IT side and facilities maintenance. And you try to equate what is that total value and how does it work and what would the cost be? <coughs> we came up with roughly $331,000 of benefit by sharing services with the city. We start looking at rates, and, and we all know that our rates are lower than consumers. If you talk to any um, of our employees that don't live in the city, which we really want them all to, but we know that some don't. So you start looking at it, and our rates, uh, based on the comparison, are 33% lower than consumers' energy. And how do you, then you equate that into what is that benefit to our customers? It comes out to be a large number, about $1.8 million, is what our benefit is to our customers by having lower rates than the the um, surrounding uh, IOU. So when we look at local employees, you know, how do we how do we calculate what the benefit of having local employees live and work where, where they are? Um, we have 57 employees. When you start looking at it, you start taking out all these stuff that's mandatory. Taxes, deferrals for savings, um, retirement, all those. You come up with what they call disposable income. So they, people can take that disposable income and spend it wherever they want. We then look at a percentage of how much do they spend outside of the community and how much do they spend inside of the community. We look at about 20% is spent outside and the rest is inside. You know, in addition to that, you look at mortgages. Do they bank with local banks? Do they have their mortgages with local banks that in turn comes back into the local community <laughs> as well? We estimate this total benefit to be about $1.6 million, $1 million a total benefit by having local employees live in the community where they serve. So if you look at the overall economic, overall annual economic benefit of what the BPU provides to the citizens of Coldwater and the city as a whole, it's roughly $7.6 million. So that's over, if you consider that we're about a $60 million company, that's about 10% that we provide back into the local economy, either through to the city's budget or to local businesses throughout here, or just then know that we don't charge as much as the local utility around us. Um, also that we have better reliability. So this is something that I wanted to, to bring out. And on the next slide, it gives you a little different look 
of what the total value is to the, the community. And one of the best things that you look is in that bottom left hand corner there is local control and decision makings happen right here and with our city council. And that, that benefit is priceless because we're not answering to shareholders, we're answering to our citizens. And I, and I hope this, benef this presentation was uh, beneficial to you. Um, I know that I've already given it once to Rotary and it was very well received there and I'd be happy to give it to the city council um, at a meeting when it's not gonna be three hours. So Keith will put that somewhere on the schedule, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that, that you would have on the presentation. Yeah, it puts it in perspective, that's for sure. Nice presentation. Yes, thank you for doing that. Okay, thank you. The next on the agenda is the Waterworks Park Spark Grant Program, or application, sorry. Keith, turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. President. Just a quick update. Um, it was going to be a little more formal, but um, the application process for round two has been simplified by the state, and we just have to essentially reapply with our existing application. But just to give a, uh, a little bit of a background or overview, a reminder in that we applied for $400,000 towards a $600,000 project for renovations to Waterworks Park. And uh, of that uh, $200,000 local match, uh, the BPU had committed 150,000 to that and the city council had contributed uh, 50,000 to that. And those improvements that are being proposed for Waterworks Park include new parking facilities, uh, new uh, asphalt paved trails, and a new youth soccer field in general renovation of the property. So uh, the due date for that is June 26th. So unless you uh, suggest to the director and I otherwise, uh, we're gonna just reapply as uh, provided for by the state. Uh, we are looking at uh, amending our application uh, from a um, technical standpoint and narrative to try to increase or improve our uh, application and score. Uh, we've, we fell in about the mid-range of the scores uh, for the 462 applications that they uh, received in the first round. Um, so we're hoping to improve our score with uh, and uh, the potential for future funding. So uh, there's no action necessary by you unless you just didn't want to pursue it any further. Uh, we're just going to uh, resubmit uh, for the second round uh, for this SPARC grant, which is uh, funds provided by the Michigan Department of Natural Resources uh, for park-related projects. Any questions related to that? Is this uh, an all or nothing, or would they do a partial payment? It appears as though it's all or nothing. So what you ask for, they are funding. And uh, of those 462 applications, their first round, which they purposely had a smaller dollar value, uh, that they were granting and trying to um, establish the process by which they were going to fund. Uh, but they funded all of the, the, of the 21 requests that they funded, they were at the full requested amount. So um, they've not suggested that they're going to give some prorated or reduced amount. It's uh, all or nothing from a standpoint of what you've asked for. In fact, we even, we offered to uh, increase our local match and we couldn't amend that. Um, they wanted to consider the applications that they received, they wanted to consider as they had previously been submitted, though you can um, state your case or amend your narrative to try to improve your scoring. So uh, we're working with the consultant that's working uh, with the BPU um, to, uh, to hopefully improve or, and uh, generate some additional points for the application itself, but uh, it's, uh, It'll be submitted at the last week of June, and we should know within a month or two uh, whether or not that was successful or not. Is there only going to be two rounds, Will there, or are there going to be more if we don't get it the second time? So they had, they had initially identified uh, the potential for up to three rounds, and um, they've not they've not suggested that or guaranteed that there's going to be a third round, but they've they kind of allocated the funds in such a way that they would uh, provide for three, depending on how they fund, say, the second round and whether or not there was any money recaptured from the first round. Um, so it's a potential, but not a guarantee. So at this point, do we have a backup to our backup plan if we don't get this round of funding and they're stop giving out money? I would then I would defer to you know, the, the BPU board and the council looking at, you know, how we might 
you know, self-funded, or there are other grant programs that can be applied for through the DNR. Those wouldn't necess- those would then be applied for come next April. Um, so you, there are other programs in which you can apply for. There would just be further further on down the line. <clears throat> Any other questions for Keith? So we'll, we'll we'll let you know when we when we find out. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Next on the agenda is Public Act 95. I'll turn it back over to the Utility Director. Thank you, Mr. President. It's our yearly uh, chance to go ahead and act on PA 95. If you remember, PA 95 was signed into law July 1 of 2013. It's a mechanism fund for low-income energy assistance by establishing a non-bypassable surcharge for every Michigan electric utility. Uh, we have the option to either opt in or opt out. If we opt in, uh, basically, we would charge a surcharge to all of our customers. Uh, last year's surcharge was 90 cents per meter. Uh, they cannot go over $1. Uh, so it, with that, if we did opt in, uh, we're looking at roughly collecting $84,000 a year for from our customers for that. Uh, by opting in, the surcharge is collected, sent to the Michigan Department of Treasury. Qualifying customers are then eligible to request to request emergency fund relief or energy, Michigan Energy Assistance Program money. Uh, not saying that they will get it, not saying that they would get it, but they're eligible for it. By opting out, our surcharge is not collected from our customers, uh, we're, but we're prohibited from disconnecting electrical customers from November 1st through April 15th, which is our current practice. The customers would still be able to apply for Michigan Energy Assistance Program funding uh, not sure how well that they would get that. So since its inceptions, we've opted out. Uh, just to give you an idea as far as write-offs, uh, last year's write-offs were a little over $36,000. And through April of this year, they're a little over $18,000. So you look at it from the standpoint of collecting $84,000 from our customers compared to what our write-offs would be and, and do you weigh the risk of what's better. Uh, I would recommend that we go ahead and opt out of PA95 like we have in the past. Uh, the only thing that it does is limits our ability to shut off customers in the winter months, uh, but we still try to collect them. We still work with them, try to get them on payment plans and, and help them any way that we can. And I know that we do have a Roundup program as well, too, to round up uh, customers' bills that actually goes to help uh, offset some of these low-income families paying their bills. So, Mr. President, I'd, I'd offer that we go ahead and uh, approve the opt-out for PA95 for the FY23-24 year. Okay. Is there any questions for the director? Need a motion? Make I'll a move to opt out of PA95. Thank you. Second. You got a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. <clears throat> motion passes. We are opted out. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the Moreau five-year inspection and preventative maintenance. I'll turn it over to Andrew Cameron. Uh, thank you, President Stevens, and good evening again, members of the board. Uh, here today to discuss the Moreau uh, substation five-year inspection and uh, preventative maintenance program. Uh, as you may recall at the previous meeting, we had presented the RFP for the Garfield substation and the uh, project for a natural gas generation facility. Uh, Moroa had requested that they allow some contractors that they work with at some of their other, uh, other facilities to bid as well. Uh, so we had backed that out of the previous board meeting to allow for their contractors to review the material uh, and proposal to generate a bid. Uh, we had eight vendors uh, that we solicited bids from with five that had returned. Uh, Premier Power was the low bid at $37,011.07. Uh, Coldwater has not worked with Premier Power before, but we have heard their name and have gotten good references from them. Uh, with Coldwater uh, operating and maintaining the substation for Moroa, uh, we have decided to uh, pay the cost up front and then recollect the money from Moroa. Uh, would make it easier from uh, scheduling coordinating outages uh, to perform this work. Uh, we would be looking to uh, coordinate this uh, in the summer time frame to uh, correspond, uh, correspond with the 
uh, operational needs of the greenhouse. Uh, so with that, I would uh, entertain any any questions. Why is there such a <clears throat> excuse me a large difference in uh, prices here? Uh, so a few of these are uh, further out of state. Uh, so for example, Energist is out of Wisconsin and Metro Tech is out of Pennsylvania. So they have further mobile, uh, higher mobilization charges. Uh, Eaton used to be who we would sole source this work from in the past. And we just wanted to see where the market was uh, and found that uh, Eaton is typically higher. They do excellent work, but they come at a premium. Uh, we also see in other bids that Maybe the workload of the contractors are uh, high, uh, so they either bid with overtime, perhaps they're uh, using union versus non-union work. Uh, it could be a, uh, a host of different uh, possibilities. Okay. But you're comfortable with the um, referrals that you've had about Premier then? That is correct. Yeah, we have reviewed their proposal and it uh, uh, meets the spec. And so with us, taking on the cost, um, you'll be involved with them directly and kind of make sure you can hit off anything that maybe you don't see. Correct, yeah, we'll like. be providing all of the, the data sheets and uh, technical reports to allow them to facilitate the, the testing and the inspection. Uh, with Maroa, they're not the experts in you know, electricity, they're the experts in growing tomatoes. So it uh, makes it easier from a uh, contract point of view for us to maintain that. Any additional questions for Andrew? There's the decision of the board. Motion to approve uh, using Premier Power Maintenance, $37,000. Got a motion to support. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Motion is passed. Mm, stay right there. <laughs> Next on the agenda is the, uh, the Bennett Street Substation Relay Panel Upgrade Project. Uh, hello again, uh, here to uh, get some panels for the Bennett Street substation. As you may recall, back in 2017, we had constructed the 1.3 megawatt solar field at the uh, Midwest Foundry site. Uh, at the time, there was only existing uh, electromechanical relays that were installed in the 80s and then again in the early 2000s. Uh, it's becoming more difficult to uh, find replacement parts for those older panels, uh, as well as they are uh, less accurate and are uh, starting to show their age. Uh, so for that solar project, we had installed a, a newer, modern uh, digital microcontroller relay. Uh, we had installed not only the breaker protection for the solar panel uh, field, uh, but also the communications uh, and satellite clock and other accessory uh, equipment that is at other substations. Uh, so uh, due to, or not only to improve the reliability uh, of the substation, but also to uh, support the interconnection of the power secure generation project, we are looking to replace eight uh, relay panels uh, with uh, two additional that will be blank uh, uh, for a total of 10 panels. Uh, cold water crews would decommission the existing panels and install the new and then would coordinate with GRP engineering to commission the panels. We would be looking to uh, complete this work in spring of 24. Uh, this would allow us time to interconnect the power secure generation uh, before the end of the MISO fiscal year or planning year rather. Uh, with this, SEL uh, was the low bid uh, however, they had requested red lines to the agreement. Uh, they had done the same thing for the previous panel project up at Michigan Avenue. Uh, at Michigan Avenue, the red line negotiations delayed the project by about five months, uh, as well as increased the liability uh, to the city of Coldwater. Uh, so again, with this contract for the Bennett relay panels, uh, they were not willing to accept the red lines that we had negotiated for the Michigan Ave project and we're looking to further increase the liability of cold water. So due to the uh, tight deadline of the power secure project, as well as, and more importantly, the increased liability to cold water, uh, we have decided not to move forward with SEL and are recommending to award the bid to EP squared uh, for a price of 
$195,740, which is roughly $11,500 higher than SEL. Uh, Coldwater has worked with EP Squared before. Uh, they provided the control house for the butter substation back in 2020. Uh, so I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? So have you, have you looked at, um, so they have their cost and their time and, um, with the, and they also want to uh, make adjustments. Have you looked at um, just, just a cost benefit with those estimated delays? You know, maybe it's five months, maybe it's two months, maybe it is, you know, maybe it's eight months. And then just, um, does that make them even more expensive? If you're looking at delay time and, and cost? Yeah, so even with the uh, estimated delivery time that SEL had provided of roughly 20 weeks, uh, if we were to award this tonight, that's going to be looking at the January, uh, February timeframe. I'll also note that SEL ships out of Mexico, so there's the potential for customs delays. Uh, ran into uh, issues with that before with our transformers for the Jonesville substation project. Those were delayed by three months. Uh, something smaller might not be so burdensome, but uh, uh, we would need to schedule a time to get these installed in the spring, uh, as well as meet the uh, April 30th deadline of interconnecting the generation. So that's uh, so where the crunch on. Yeah, we're already knocking on the door, yeah. so a, uh, okay. even a couple of weeks lead time definitely eats into our buffer. Any additional questions for Andrew? I'll make a motion to approve the bid for EP squared. Okay. I'll support. You got a motion to support. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Motion is passed. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Next on the agenda is the MISO auction results. Turn back over to the utility director. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm not going to go through the 49 page presentation that MISO has which is included in your packet i at your leisure please go ahead and read that if you would like to take a little nap uh, so MISO finally got their capacity auction completed for the 23-24 season uh, the this year's results plunged from 236 66 megawatt day to two dollars megawatt day to 15 megawatts a day remember right, one of the things that they really looked at we talked about before is the way that they were going from a yearly total a seasonal construct so summer fall winter spring they came up with a different price for each one uh, so with that seasonal format there were some delays because FERC wanted some different things done wanted them to look at different things uh, so the MISO zones include Michigan and zone 7 uh, Indiana zone 4 which is our some of our hydro plants uh, Candleton uh, Illinois zone 6 which is Prairie State and Smithland hydro and everything kind of everything dropped and they're not quite sure why it dropped, other than Zone 7, no, not Zone 7, which is the one that, Zone so 4 zone, and 6. I'm sorry, no, if you scroll up a little zone bit. Zone 9? Zone nine. 9. I thought it was Zone 9. But... Zone 9 went crazy, and no one really knows why. No one can explain why they, they did what they did. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to let you know, um, just to give you the heads up. You remember right last year when we talked about when the MISO auction <laughs> ended, we were at $7, $7.20 per megawatt day. Uh, currently, with these with these, I'm sorry, megawatt KW month. Let me get the terms right. Meg KW month. I wrote it down, and I can't read my own writing. It's pretty bad. So in the summer, you're looking at 30 cents. Fall is 46 cents. Winter is six cents, and spring is 30 cents. Now, what does that mean? Well, that just means that capacity is going to be a little cheaper potentially, um, but that doesn't mean that energy costs are going down. This is just the capacity auction itself. It doesn't, it plays a little bit into the, the energy market, but not a lot where you're thinking that, oh my, my prices are gonna drop in half. As you, as you heard from Amanda earlier, AMP is projecting our average cost per kilowatt hour to be higher next year than it is this year. And that's part of it. So one of the things that we do is we're still looking at what needs to be done, how to work all these things. Uh, the crazy part about the auction is that we are only allowed to purchase 5% on the auction. So 5% is not a whole lot when you look at our total portfolio compared to what we are looking at here. But I just want to give you guys a heads up because I know we gave you this uh, information last year, just so that you know where the auction came in and, and it does look better. 
but it doesn't mean that prices are going to drop as much as the auction prices drop for capacity. So more to come on that as more of the analysis is are done and we continue to look at different ways to make sure that we can secure reliable and, and low cost power for our customers. I'd be happy to try to answer any questions other than that 49 page report. Looks like we're no. good on that. Yeah. We'll move on over to the AMP Michigan Cat Peaking Project. Thank you, Mr. President. Just a brief overview, because we'll talk a little bit more numbers wise, because we're under a non-disclosure agreement for that. Um, Andrew, you want to handle this or you want me to, or? Uh, I can handle that if you want me to. Uh, so this ties in nicely with the presentation Paul just gave on the, uh, the PRA results from the auction. Uh, so there's three main things that make up or three main components that make up our cost uh, in our power supply bill. That's transmission, energy, capacity, uh, transmission being moving energy from point A to point B. In MISO Zone 7 or Michigan, there's not really anything we can do to mitigate our transmission bill. Uh, energy is just volumetric. It's based on how much energy we need. And uh, more importantly, uh, recently has been capacity, which is synonymous with reliability, making sure that there's enough energy there uh, when people need it. Uh, for both capacity and energy, there's a number of different ways that we can uh, try to mitigate against our increased costs. We can either have a bilateral agreement, which is a contract between two entities, uh, or we can have a project. Uh, there's pros and cons to both. Uh, with a project, we get a little bit of price certainty where there's not going to be variations in pricing from a, uh, an alternative partner. Uh, so we are looking at installing a behind the meter, uh, which just means connected to the distribution system, a seven and a half megawatt natural gas facility at the Michigan Ave substation. This is off of State Street where we used to have uh, cat diesels in the early 2000s. Uh, Coldwater, along with other members at the MSCPA, were originally looking at moving forward with a uh, 45 megawatt natural gas plant referred to as Project 5. When Project 5 fell through uh, due to escalating costs due to uh, queue delays, uh, we needed something to replace that, that capacity. Uh, that is why uh, we had recommended the Power Secure project at the Bennett substation, uh, as well now as Michigan Cat uh, at the Michigan Avenue substation. Uh, so uh, not only would this be a capacity resource, it can also be economically dispatched to reduce the realized cost of capacity. Uh, so uh, we are recommending three different items related to this project. Uh, first would be uh, approval for a uh, lease agreement, roughly 30,000 square feet at the Michigan Ave substation. Uh, with that being related to real estate, uh, that would also need to go towards uh, go to the city council as well. Uh, the second item would be uh, the approval of an interconnection agreement that essentially allows AMP to connect to our distribution system. And then finally would be to amend the power sales contract uh, to integrate this into our system, into our portfolio. Uh, so I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have for Paul or myself on this. Or, or if you want to hold off on your questions, like I said, this is one of the closed session topics uh, only because of the NDA that we're under with the pricing structure that is, is out there. So more to come on that. I, my recommendation would be to hold off any questions or any recommendations until we, we get done with the, the closed session on this item. Sounds good. All right, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Members. Next is public comment. Is there any public comment? Seeing none, we'll move on to new business. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as we always have, the first thing is power cost adjustment. Uh, this month's power PCA is 0 0.01380, and PCA for the secondary meters is 0 0.01421. Uh, some of the increased costs are because our, some of our plants were under maintenance, so we had to purchase uh, supplemental power to go ahead and offset those. The main one is AFEC which is the Fremont Energy Center. And then there's also some uh, work done out at Prairie State. On a personal note or personnel note, uh, Bryce Withington has completed his mandatory 7,000 hours and is now completed uh, per the Department of Labor 
uh, completion of his apprenticeship program. Uh, we want to congratulate him to becoming a journeyman lineman. As you saw uh, earlier and got introduced earlier to our interns, it's the first year we've had five interns uh, with this between the city and BPU. Uh, Audrey Steele is with uh, Summer Community Engagement Assistant. Brayton Franklin is a GIS turn. Elijah Quinn is the IT intern. Frank Monig is the engineering turn. And Haley Richard is an economic development intern. So we welcome all to uh, BPU and the city family and, and look forward to their presentations when their internship is done in a, in a couple months. Uh, we, we participated in Kids Consider Careers Days, where sixth graders go out and try to decide if they want to be a lineman, be in a water department, or uh, be a fireman or a policeman, or go to college and be something else. So it's a really great benefit that we can provide to our local youth to give them an idea of what they, what they want to do for their future. Uh, the recipient of the 2023 CBPU Scholarship was uh, Brian Torres Alcantar. Uh, Brian was enrolled in Computer Network Technology Program at BACC. Uh, he'll be uh, pursuing a degree at Western Michigan in Computer Science. And Brian was presented a $1,000 scholarship check at the Senior Recognition Ceremony on May 19th. Uh, the first ever CBPU and City Blood Drive is being held on Monday, June 26th from 10 a.m. to 345 at Heritage Hall. Uh, we like to fill all 55 time slots. Uh, currently, we have about 20 slots filled, uh, uh, BPU employees and uh, BPU employee spouses. Uh, so we like to uh, have any of the board members, by all means, come in and join and, and help out with this great cause in the community. Uh, you can go ahead and contact Abby to get scheduled, or you can get on Red Cross's website and uh, schedule your appointment that way. Uh, just a reminder, Strawberry Fest is coming up Saturday, June 17th from 9 a.m. till 3. Uh, there'll be craft vendors, food, kids activities, music are planned. Of course, make sure you buy lots of strawberries and make strawberry pies and strawberry jam. And, and make sure you bring that in and share it with the, the BPU employees. Uh, just to let everyone know that we will be having a booth at Strawberry Fest. Uh, at that booth will be a coloring wall. And no, we're not going to be coloring on the walls in downtown. And I was told it's just a giant sheet of paper with a, a picture on there. And you have the time to drop, drop the kids off, have them color while you're out shopping the other vendors. But please go ahead and, and join the BPU uh, booth. Picture of the director? No, that's behind, line, no. That's, that's behind okay. the building. Dang it. Uh, the reminder, uh, June 24th is a kickoff of the uh, farmer's market. It will be at the renovated Four Corners Park in the northwest corner. So please join uh, the local vendors and, and purchase some uh, good vegetables and other goods that they have there. It's open from 9 a.m. till 10, and it will go through till September 9th. Uh, another downtown event, Hops on Monroe, starts June 29th and will continue through August 31st. It's the fourth season, and as we all know, it's got food trucks, crafts, craft beers, musical entertainment, outdoor games, and they close down South Monroe from 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. And if you're looking for Tom at 9 p.m., he is normally just getting off of work and heading over there to, to see what's left. Mm -hmm. uh, just a reminder, 4th of July observance is actually on July 4th this year. Uh, the city and CBPU offices will be closed on that Tuesday, July 4th. Uh, just a little update as well, too, and Abby gave me this uh, Monday morning. So as you know, we're working on our survey. Uh, right now, they're getting into the phone survey portion of that. We've heard a couple complaints on that, and we've reached out to Great Blue to try to alleviate some of those complaints that, that we've heard some from the citizens that have been doing that. But just on the digital side, we had 118 digital surveys completed. Uh, which re, comes out to roughly 5% of our total residential customers uh, had submitted data back. So more to come on that as we get ready to get the results. Hopefully within the next two months, we'll be able to present to the board of those findings. Uh, we did have a thank you from the BACC for our scholarship. And that is my report, Mr. President. Thank you. Nikki, the date of the next meeting. Wednesday, July 5th. Good, John? I think so. July 5th is going to be okay with you. Um, Day after I guess. <laughs> Chris won't be able to. I won't be here, so, so I kinda, we kind of need to know for sure. Kinda, oh, that's all in your choice. Okay, so yes, I will make sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make that. 
Okay. No Thank pressure, you. of course. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next we'll be moving into closed session pursuant to section 8H of PA 267 of the 1976 to consider material exempt from discussion or disclosure by the state or federal statute for all three closed sessions. No, actually they're a little different. Oh, there you are. Yep. That's session number one. Session number two is closed session pursuant to section 8A of PA 267 of 1976 to conduct a periodic evaluation of the at the request of the director. Uh, closed session number three is uh, closed session pursuant to the section 8H of PA 267 of 1976 to consider material exempt from discussion or disclosure by state or federal statute a written legal opinion. I need, I need a motion to go into closed session, please. Motion to go into closed session. Report. And roll call. President Stevens. Yes. Vice President Ohm. Yes. Member Mackin. Yes. And Member Willette. Yes. Don, we will be coming back out if you want to hang out. It might be a little while. Okay. <laughs> should, should we get you a recliner, make it a little more comfortable? I got some snack. I got some snacks up here. <laughs> so Andrew's going to join us for the first session. Okay. He's going to join us for all sessions. Okay. That's my girlfriend. I'm sure she is. Do not feed you. <laughs>
Based on the Michigan CAP project, which we had talked about, the recommended motion is to approve resolution 2302, execu or authorizing execution of the power sa supply contract, power sales contract with AMP, which includes the interconnection agreement as well, and approve the lease agreement number A23-12, which details the area of the project and forward that on to the city council for their consideration. Motion. Oh, okay. Support. Yeah. Got a motion support. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Motion carried. Um, you know what? I think that might be a roll call. We can do a roll call. Yeah, let's just do a roll call. Just Vice President Ohm. Yes. Member Mackin. Yes. Member Willette. Yes. And member or President Stevens. Yes. Next on the agenda is a motion um, to increase uh, the director's annual compensation by 5% um, over the previous year's level, um, effective July 1st of 2023. Is there a motion on that? I'd like to make a motion and thank the director for a, a great last year and doing a great job with BPU. Thank you. Second. Got a motion and a second. Do a roll call vote on that, please. Yes, sir. Member Mackin? Yes. Member Willette? Yes. Vice President Ohm? Yes. President Stevens? Yes. Thank you all for having a confidence in having me uh, run the utility. Anything else here. before we adjourn? See nothing? We're adjourned. Ooh. This is my longest ever BP board. I think so too. I was too rough. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me give you the keys, Don. You can handle it. <laughs>